We have Eddie, Belanger, Hunter, Svoboda, Alfred. Rombley moved up to the first roll. Every year for the past 75, the Montreal Canadiens have posed for a team photograph. This year, for the first time, they've had a different kind of picture taken. from your father, who first heard them from his, Aurel Joliat, Howie Morenz, Rocket Richard, Jean Beliveau. For three quarters of a century, they've dominated their sport as no team has any other. Gel with gel today. Going with the gel, Tilly? Going to say that greasy Italian. Greg, when you finished three parties this morning, the coach said you're better than running. Hey, guys. They're going to have to play. That's what he's saying. They're going to have Lutz's corner. Hey, Lutz? I watch Chuck go. Good lucky. Chivay? Adi? In all, the Montreal Canadiens have won 22 Stanley Cups. In the past three decades, one almost every two years. In the, in the NHL, Matt Snesson. The best sentiment was injuries for three, three weeks. Yeah, Mondu. The best for Best for for sure, Mario Tomlin. Mario! He's looking for Mario. What are you looking at? Oh, yeah, you should talk. Joe Strap around the face. Oh, tell me, tell me a real. Five again. Three. Seasoned veterans. Yeah. Slow. Yeah. There's nobody chasing us. So the guy put out the punch of like. But you right. know what screws you know screws me up right off the bat is when you got it over there and then all of a sudden you pass it across. Now all everything. If you just hang on to it and go in, then I can play you a lot better. I just cut you off so you can't pass it. So that's why. In French, they call the Montreal Canadiens tradition la ligne, the line, spanning the past 75 years through Bob Gainey and Larry Robinson. Somebody be pushing them. When I first started up and I came into the dressing room my first day, I mean, I was scared stiff. I sat there. Uh, I was afraid. I mean, the first pair of shin pads I had were Morris Richard's old shin pads, you know, and I, 
I felt uh, shy to go over and ask if I could have a pair that, that fit me. You know, they were that much too small. And um, I find nowadays that if the, in the same situation, one of the hockey players, for a young hockey player, if he could come up, he would, he would be mad and insulted that he didn't get a brand new pair. And uh, they're much, much bolder, more outspoken, uh, the kids of today. 210 pounds of dynamite with a one-inch fuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Okay, it's When Robinson and Ganey first joined the Canadians in the 1970s, they were the flying Frenchmen on the verge of winning four consecutive Stanley Cups. Today, their teammates include a Swede, a Czech, and as many Americans as Quebecois. But they're heirs to the richest legacy in all of sport. No one knows the story better than this man, Aurel Joliet. He's 84 years old now, a retired railway ticket agent. But in 1922, Aurel Joliet was a young James Cagney in the uniform of the Montreal Canadiens. Just 138 pounds in full gear, he could skate, he could stick handle, and he never turned his back on a fight. Today, Aurel Joliet is one of the oldest members of hockey's oldest team. He still skates the ice of the Rideau Canal in Ottawa, still at his old playing weight, and he still says that all he's ever truly been is an athlete. I played uh, junior, intermediate, and senior city league, you know. And I was playing with, with, uh, against and with fellows that were 30 and 35 years of age, and I was only about 16. My mother and father never told me what to do after that. So it was a great life. I, uh, to be a little dramatic, or not dramatic, but a little rough and tough, said, I played my own way. Joliet was 19, playing amateur hockey in northern Ontario, when he got a call from the Ottawa Senators of the new National Hockey League. General Manager Tom Gorman asked him to turn pro. Well, Tommy, I said, how much are you going to give me? He said, I'll offer you $250 the season, just as a spare. A spare very, very seldom got on the ice. In those days, six men played the whole game. So he said, if you're going out the door, he said, listen, Joliet, he says, if you don't play here, he says, I'll bar you completely. I said, thanks very much, Tommy. See you again sometime. The interview was no longer than that, about a minute at the most. It was an era long before free agents in sport, and if Aurel Joliet didn't want to play for his hometown team, Tom Gorman could keep him from playing for anyone else. He did bar me, yeah. He barred me. I wasn't allowed to play in the National Hockey League. So it was that Aurel Joliet left Ottawa and headed west, to the prairies, where he got off the train in Saskatchewan. There, for the price of his $5 train ticket, he became the property of the new professional team from Saskatoon. It was a deal typical of Aurel Joliet's financial career. I lived a simple life. I don't go for fame and prosperity. Of course, I always like to have money, but... I don't like to spend money, I just like to throw it away. Six decades later, Joliet says he sometimes wishes he'd stayed in Saskatchewan, found a real job, and forgotten all about hockey. But that's not what happened. In the early 1920s, Montreal was the Paris of hockey, home of Le Club de Hockey Canadien, founded a dozen years before. Nicknamed the Flying Frenchman, they were led by a star forward named Newsy Lalonde. The Canadians had won their first Stanley Cup in the middle of the First World War. But by the 20s, Lalonde was past his prime. Team owner Leo Dandurin needed a scorer to complement his great goalie, Georges Vézina. And he'd heard of a man out west named Aurel Joliat. 
It was the fall of 1922. Montreal convinced the NHL to let Joliet return from exile and traded Lalonde to Saskatoon to get him. And as fate would have it, the Canadians' first exhibition game was against their old star's new team. Montreal was still the Paris of hockey. Saskatoon was not. And New Zealand wanted revenge. Well, anyway, I made one rush up the ice and uh, wasn't in condition yet. I was uh, puffing pretty hard, you know. The lawn edged over, you know, and he gave it to me right here. And the first thing I knew, I was laying flat on the ice, out cold as a cucumber. There were quite a few guys that could hit with the stick in those days. Don't forget, you had to keep ducking a few times. Lalonde and Joliet. Few names in any field have meant so much as the Montreal Canadiens and the Montreal Forum. What La Scala is to opera, the Louvre to fine art, that's what this place is to hockey. And seldom has it seen more dramatic events than those inspired by the Canadiens' first great star, Howie Morenz. He really wasn't a flying Frenchman at all, Morenz. He was from a small town in Ontario where they called him the Stratford Streak. At the age of 20, the Canadians paid a $45 tailor's bill and Morenz came to Montreal to play center for Aurel Joliet. He was a marvelous hockey player. Instinctively marvelous hockey player. It, it, it was a picnic to play with Morenz. I remember playing games with Morenz. I walked off the ice after playing 60 minutes uh, something like going out and playing another game. Marvelous, you know, so fast. God. Yeah. Howie Morenz became the best hockey player of his generation. He and Joliet were hard-living, hard-playing men who were together for 12 years and won three Stanley Cups. If it weren't for him, said Morenz, they wouldn't write so much about me. It worked out very good for a while until Moran had his leg broken in this game. It was early in the new year of 1937. Morenz and Joliet were aging, but Montreal was still fighting for first place. Six days after this dressing room picture, Howie Morenz and the Canadians played Chicago at the Forum. made one of his famous rushes and he went to turn and he skidded and he ended up and his right foot went right into the end boards and it stuck there, you see. And this big guy playing defense for Chicago, Earl Seibert, fell on his leg right there. You'd think he'd have done it on purpose. No, no kidding. Morenza's leg was broken in four places. The doctor said he was through for the season. But no one could guess what would happen next. And finally, I came back from Boston, went up to see him, and uh, he was in a stupor. He was, well, to tell you the truth, I said, this isn't Morenza at all. He had faded away in about 10 days' time. He'd, to tell you the truth, I didn't know. Unbelievable. Howie Morenz never returned to the Montreal Canadiens. Forty days after the game against Chicago, he got out of his hospital bed, tried to walk, collapsed, and died. He was only 34. The city of Montreal was in shock. Howie Morenz's body was taken to the forum so his fans could say goodbye. 
Well, this is quite an impressive sight, all right. You know? 15,000 people. It was very, very quiet, nevertheless, in the four of me. Well, Marin played his best hockey and uh, trailed the uh, thousands of people over the years. He said, whenever I can't play hockey, he says, I just as soon be dead. Yeah. I remember him telling me that. the only ghost to haunt the Montreal Forum. There are the spirits of countless playoffs past, uncounted cups to come, and of the man whose name and number are the greatest legend hockey has ever known. La rondelle est mise au jeu. Emile Bouchard reçoit la rondelle à la ligne bleue. Il lance vers le filet de Brodin, le disque qui est pris par Stewart, qui à son tour lance le caoutchouc à la ligne bleue. Et c'est Blake qui reçoit la rondelle. Passe à Martel. Martel à Richard. Richard lance. Et goal! pour le Canadien. Alors qu'il ne reste plus que 14 secondes à jouer en troisième période, Maurice Richard... We all wore the same costume as Maurice Richard did. The red, white and blue costume of the Montreal Canadiens. The best hockey team in the world. We all combed our hair like Maurice Richard. And we used a kind of hair glue to keep it in place. We laced our skates like Maurice Richard. We taped our sticks like Maurice Richard. We cut his picture out of all the newspaper, and we knew everything there was to know about Maurice Richard. <laughs> Yes, when the referee blew his whistle, both teams would rush at the puck. We were five Maurice Richards, again five other Maurice Richards, throwing themselves on the puck. We were ten players, all wearing the uniform of the Montreal Canadiens, all with the same burning enthusiasm. We all wore the famous number nine on our backs. How could we forget that? Hello, comment ça va? How are you? Yeah. You speak French? Or... French and English. In English. Fix it on, toi. Patrick. Patrick. Uh... Paris, tu es un joueur de hockey? Oui. Tu joues pour qui, la Mont-Royal, le hockey, c'est quoi? C'est la l'Université de Montréal? It has been more than a quarter of a century since Rocket Richard scored his final goal. Je ne me rappelle pas de l'avoir rencontré, mais est-ce qu'il demeure dans ce bout ici? Non. Many of the youngsters who still fight to wear his number on their backs likely wouldn't recognize the man who made it famous. Tu connais pas ça? Et moi, j'ai joué ici au hockey dans, dans ce terrain-là. And the record book he once dominated now scarcely contains his name. 
I think I had about uh, 24 or 25 record in the hockey book in the National Hockey League. And I had many in the, uh, in the Stanley Cup playoff. And today, after 25 years, well, I, I don't think I got one left in the, during the season. Well, no doubt there should have been two set of records. And they should have stopped the record in, uh, in 1967 when they, expand, they did the, the first expansion. Well, it's hard to compare. Uh, I, I hate to talk about that with the young generation because they never saw hockey 25, 30 years ago. It was more than 40 years ago, in 1942, when Maurice Richard first joined the Montreal Canadiens. In training camp the following season, coach Dick Irvin put him on a line with Elmer Locke and Toe Blake. The punchline, they were called. And in 1945, the Rockets scored 50 goals in 50 games, beating the record set in 1917, the very first year of the NHL. In just three seasons, Richard had become history's most explosive scorer. I yeah, just felt the same way all the time, nervous. I was always nervous. And uh, when I was on the ice, I wanted to win so much that uh, there's a lot of things that I did I don't remember. And a lot of the, lot of the goals that I score, I don't remember. But it wasn't just the goals the Rocket scored, it was the way he played. When Elmer Locke scored in overtime to win the 1953 Stanley Cup, Richard hugged him so hard he broke his nose. Goalie Terry Sotchuk said the most fearsome sight in hockey was the Rocket's eyes. And in Richard's tempestuous career, there was no more stormy season than 1954-55. The Rocket leading the scoring race, he had ironically never won. The Canadians battling their arch rivals, Detroit. It was an emotional time. He was by now a hero across Canada and a tribal god in Quebec. More and more often, he faced strong arm tactics, argued with officials, and retaliated. It came to a head in Boston, just two weeks remaining in the season. Richard fought Bruin defenseman Hal Laco. He hit Laco with his stick and broke it. He grabbed another and hit Laco again. Restrained by a linesman, he attacked him too. For league officials, it was the last straw. When he returned to Montreal, Richard was summoned to the office of NHL president Clarence Campbell. Whether this type of conduct is the product of temperamental instability or willful defiance of the authority in the game does not matter. Richard will be suspended from all games, both league and playoff, for the balance of the current season. Yeah, I don't think I deserved the suspension of the whole playoff. Uh, I got suspended for the last three games of the season, but the, the playoff had nothing to do with the season. I think the, uh, the decision, they, they should have taken another decision to, uh, to suspend me for the following season, maybe for 10, 15, or 20 games. But the playoff was uh, kind of hard to take. The suspension hit at the very heart and soul of French Canada. The following day, the Canadians were to play Detroit. The main entrance of the Forum on St. Catherine Street, a huge crowd of people... Before the game, a crowd gathered, growing in size and growing ugly. They were trying to stop the streetcars. They're on the streetcar tracks, but the uh, police at the moment seem to have things uh, well in hand. The rocket arrived just before game time. But the game was second. All eyes were on Richard, as Montreal, without him, fell behind. Suddenly, unexpected, Clarence Campbell entered the arena. He took his usual seat. Then it began. The deluge of fruit, programs, rubbers, verbal abuse, and violence. The first period had just ended when the bomb went off sending clouds of smoke towards Canada. The NHL president finally sought refuge. The crowd forgot about Campbell and rushed for the exits. The game was forfeited to Detroit. As they cheer, as, as the police try to push them back, the police are now forming a line and pushing the crowd back. Right in the of it is the following thing, Campbell. Outside, the rioting raged on for hours. Stores were looted, cars overturned and set on fire. Eight policemen and 25 civilians were injured. 
damage was in the millions. The mob rampaged along St. Catherine Street until four o'clock in the morning. The next day, from the ravaged forum, Richard spoke on radio. My dear friend, because I always tried so hard to win and had my trouble at Boston, I was suspended. At playoff time, it hurt not to be in the game with the boys. So that no further harm will be done, I would like to ask everyone to get behind the team and help the boys to win from Rangers and Detroit. But there was no happy ending. Teammate Boom Boom Jeffreyon won the scoring title and was booed for it. In the playoffs, the Canadians were again beaten by Detroit. The Red Wings got the cup from Clarence Campbell. Another big leg from Mr. Campbell. I wasn't sure it was him that took the decision or the owners, but I think it was a bad decision. And uh, that's what is in my mind, and I got, uh, yeah, I got that in my mind since that time, and uh, I'll never forget that. But Maurice Richard also never lost another Stanley Cup. In the next five years, the Canadians established a record that stands to this day. In 1960, as Montreal defeated the Toronto Maple Leafs to win their fifth consecutive championship, the Rockets scored his final goal. Maurice Richard, Maurice Richard passed it right in front of the net board, took a whack at it, Maurice Richard right in front of the net in hockey has changed since Rocket Richard played his last game. But not the best of it. Wow, the dog is... There are still skates for Christmas. And there are still dreams. Sunday morning, we would uh, play on the little ice surface that everybody had at that time behind the house. And one boy would be uh, a Toad Lake, another one Elmer Lack, another one Maurice Richard. Like today, I suppose, uh, when you're 10, 12, 13 years old, you, you hope or you believe at that age that you're going to make a, a career in professional sport. From the very beginning, Jean Beliveau's destiny was clear. At home in Victoriaville, Quebec, he recalls the priests who coached him blocking shots with their clerical skirts. By the time he was a junior in Quebec City, they had to build a new rink to hold all the people who came to see him play. At the age of 20, he was the most heralded player in Canada. But then there was a strange twist to the story. Jean Beliveau refused to join the Montreal Canadiens and the NHL. At the end of my junior uh, time, uh, they had a day in Quebec and where they uh, present me with a car in 1951. First car. I never had a car before. Be so I decided to uh, to play another year. We had a good Quebec Senior League. Punch him like was coaching. And I decided to play in a year to show my appreciation to the people of Quebec. <laughs> Beliveau said it was a matter of loyalty. There were those who said he couldn't afford to turn pro. Indeed, Jean Beliveau made $20,000 a year in Quebec, as much as Rocket Richard, the best paid player in the NHL. I never hide it. I said it at the time. I said, don't forget. I said, if I'm staying here, it's because I'm well paid. No doubt about that, uh, that I was well paid. I used to... Uh, uh, report to the Canadian training camp every fall. And you can imagine when I was leaving Quebec <laughs> that those people in Quebec were a little nervous and they used to tell me whatever they offer you, Jean, same thing here. Jean Beliveau was every inch the matinee idol. 
his wedding in the spring of 1953, the social occasion of the year. When he flees with my heart with Cordes, twisted at the end of two rings, the thism in the camp, the village of Tivlar in life, with a truth, first arm on the data. The man had got some ice, one and the By before, inspired by a some trading to the late 1950s, been great tea ever, and then plays still for all years. We are more Marshall, Young, Han, Paul Blake, and the top quality and Senator Molson. It was some time in war, because why by a state, the earth and woman car, not a great issue had all game Chicago. And to try to count their Stanley Cups. 34, 34, 40. I got five. So it's 40. Yeah, but I got mine with different teams. You got three different teams. If you wouldn't have played too well in Chicago, we would have had another one. Yeah. But it would have still added up to the same. What are you going to do? It would have been the same. Only I would have had the money in my pocket instead of you. Yeah, it would be Yeah, you broke the string, eh? Maybe. I was going good that year, you know. I had a young broad and it was given me to whatever. I just got to tell the truth. And the ocean. You understand that? I do. For these men, it was the best of times. But in a way, also the worst. They won five consecutive Stanley Cups, a feat accomplished neither before nor since. But for the men who followed, for anything less than the Stanley Cup, there was no excuse. In my case, I remember coming out of the farm after a, a hockey game here, after scoring two goals, and you could hear some people, well, you could, you could have scored three. And on some night I scored three, you could have scored four, and I was lucky enough to score four on a few occasions, and I could have scored five. So you have the feeling that whatever you do, it's not enough. It's hard. Merci à la fleur. Well, Lafleur's Lafleur, and that's the putter cleanly. Lafleur did it all. He come up the ice with full speed. They left the puck for him. And he gets it into the air. Back to Lafleur. Oh! What could be more appropriate if anyone? This Canadian's goal scored by number ten, Guy Lafleur. <laughs> <laughs> Jean Belliveau played for the Montreal Canadiens until the age of 40. A generation later, and seven years younger, the last of the Canadiens' crown jewels, Guy Lafleur, has announced that he too will retire. When he was Lafleur's age, Belliveau still had five Stanley Cups to win. But today, for Lafleur, there are the eulogies that only great athletes get to hear. <laughs> he was uh, a player that displayed individual talents, but uh, never uh, forgot about his teammates and his hockey team. And any time you win six Stanley Cups, that's a, a great honor. And uh, I think Lafleur was uh, one of the best to play and a uh, very, very great gentleman off the ice. Wayne Gretzky, c'est lui. Wayne. He can still skate like the wind. But with two goals in his last 43 games, the magic, the most important part, has gone. Well, I never uh, doubted in my mind that I was not able to score till 40 or 50 goals again. It was tough enough to uh, uh, read the paper or uh, heard people talking, uh, when are you going to get out of your slump, things like that. So uh, that's why I decided to retire. It's one of the reasons why. The Lafleur story is, in many ways, a modern Canadian fable, which begins in the town of Thurso, Quebec. Growing up here, your future lay somewhere between three main landmarks. The paper mill, the hockey rink, and the Catholic Church. Well, like the rest of the, the kids today, when they're eight years old, uh, I remember I was an altar boy in, uh, Alto boy, and I wanted to be a priest, but that's a good thing I changed my mind. Uh, because I, 
was there in the morning and we missed class and uh, that was the only reason why I was in Octoborn. But uh, when the, uh, the priest was, was close friends with our family at that time and he came here, he said, uh, how much time do you have to go to school to be a priest? And when he told me, I said, forget it. <laughs> So Guy Lafleur made another choice. And now the road which leads to the Thurso Arena is Guy Lafleur Boulevard. When Lafleur was nine years old, as his son Martin is now, on Friday nights he'd sleep in his equipment, skates next to the bed, and early Saturday morning he'd sneak into the darkened rink by himself through a hole in the arena wall. You had the, the ice for yourself alone. There's nobody around you, and uh, you were able to practice uh, shooting the puck off the board, where the puck's going to go. And uh, I kept that till uh, the day I decided to retire, because uh, even at the forum, I was there an hour before everybody, so just to get practice. At the age of 10, wearing Jean Pelliveau's number four, he was the star of the Quebec Pee Wee tournament. The dream of one day becoming a Montreal Canadian already firmly fixed in his imagination. It's always been my team because Jean Villeneuve was my uh, idol and uh, Henri Richard, Conoyer, uh, uh, Jean-Claude Tremblay at that time. Uh, they were all guys that I was watching uh, every night. You know, every time they played, I was watching them, and especially Jean Villeneuve. Like Villeneuve before him. Guy Lafleur set out to make hockey not just his job or his career, but his life. He, too, was the preeminent junior in Quebec City and in the country. The rink built for Bellevue, again full for Lafleur. But Guy Lafleur was a different kind of player than Bellicott. And in hockey, these were different times. No longer did the top prospects in Quebec belong by divine right to the Montreal Canadiens. But if not by divine right, then maybe by a little divine inspiration. Three years before Lafleur was eligible to join the NHL, Montreal had traded for the draft choice they'd used to get him. From the Quebec just a week before, Jean Bellevaux had announced he'd played his final game. People were expecting me to replace Jean Bellevaux because he was he just retired, and uh, I'm sure if uh, it wouldn't have been uh, for the publicity that I had, they would have sent me to Halifax. Uh, people expect me to score 50 goals the first year. I had to go uh, through the system because uh, I had to learn their style. And, uh, took me three years. Guy Lafleur learned well in those years. He went on to score 50 goals six times and to win five Stanley Cups. I remember when I first came up here, we've always been brought up with veteran guys, 12, 15 years old, guys who won the Stanley Cup. Uh, we knew uh, what kind of feeling it was to win. And when you got too many young players on the team, uh, it's tough to explain what it is to win the, the Stanley Cup. Guy Lafleur became the most exciting player since Rocket Richard. I started the season, I used to put uh, myself a goal, you know, I would like to have a 100-point season, things like that, win a Stanley Cup. I didn't ask for five, but I, I was asking for one, and I won five, and uh, championship uh, of the league three times, and I won most of the teams, uh, except for one, the Lady Bing, but <laughs> it's not too bad. But I'm very happy about it, and uh, I didn't maybe have enough uh, motivation at the end, too, you know, I said, uh, uh, 
because I had everything that I wanted. Even for a great player like Guy Lafleur, retirement comes too soon. In any other field, he'd be in his prime. In hockey, his career is over. And it's more difficult for a man with the passion of Lafleur, who once said he sometimes felt his sport was more important than his family. You know, I always say what I had in mind, and uh, I heard maybe my family, my wife, but uh, she knew anyway that uh, the way I was, and hockey was first. Uh, it was my career, it was my bread and butter, and uh, uh, I know it's not nice to say that, but uh, to me it was very important that I concentrate myself uh, uh, on something that made me what I am today and uh, what gave me, uh, uh, gave me a lot of things, you know. Uh, hockey was, I don't know, it was like it was part of me. It was uh, my dream when I was a kid, and uh, and it's still I look back and it's it's like a dream. Mesdames et messieurs, ladies and gentlemen. Monsieur Aurel Joliat. I well, just felt like as if I'd like to start all over again. You know? He's okay. They made him tough when they made this man. And then when I had the big acclaim, all of a sudden I hit the carpet and I took another nose down. Folks, he's having a little fun, I'm sure. But he wants to do it one more time. He played with the great Howie Moran, an all-star left winger. Well, Bobby certainly got the job done. Was he excited about coming out to this event? He was smiling and joking in that dressing room while getting dressed for, the, for this type of event. Just a bundle of laughs. Another great night at the Montreal Forum. I feel good. Pretty good living, after all. We didn't make fortunes. I ended up broke. Not a dime. I owed money when I quit hockey. <laughs> Chaque soir, vers 
Everybody looking here, please? That's nice. That's all. Thank you very much. Yeah.